further ado, I want to introduce our special guest today, Jonathan Crook. Uh, the New York Times states that Jonathan Crook has a way with the spoken word, the telling gesture, the sprinkling of humor, and the appropriate costume for a smorgasbord of stories. And Jonathan was born in Texas, but was raised, you're a Westchester boy, right? Raised yes. In Westchester. And every year he enchants at hundreds of schools. He's been to the college schools, and I'm sure East Chester schools and Bronxville schools, I'm sure as well. Libraries, he's been at our library. Historic sites and festivals by telling the programs to each venue. He is best known for his solo shows of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow and A Christmas Carol. He's been featured on The Today Show, The Travel Channel, CBS Sunday Morning, and the BBC. And he has eight award-winning recordings and two books, Legends and Lore of Sleepy Hollow and the Hudson Valley, and Legends and Lore of the Hudson Highlands. And today, he will bring us the Headless Horseman of White Plains, the revolutionary origin story. So please welcome Master Storyteller, <laughs> Jonathan Crook. Thank you. During a nameless battle in the American Revolution, boom! A Yankee cannonball carried away the head of a Hessian trooper and brought down his horse. Thus speaks Washington Irving in his classic, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Later in the story, he goes on to describe an eerie scene. Upon mounting, arise with a waxing moon. The schoolmaster finally got a full look at his fellow traveling companion. Yea, the other rider sat upon a nightmarish mare. And the rider, in a snapping cloak, looked huge misshapen, monstrous. Imagine the schoolmaster's horror, looking to find the face of his fellow traveling companion and discovering it had no head. Imagine the schoolmaster's increasing terror when there, on the pummel of the saddle, glowered the missing head. And thus the chase begins, that galloping goblin, that headless Hessian taking off after the hapless schoolmaster from Connecticut, Ichabod Crane. All he wanted to do was court Spark and marry the richest girl in town, Katrina Van Tassel. Was it the horseman? The real goblin, a real goblin, who chased off Ichabod Crane, or could it have been Abraham Van Brunt, disguised as the headless horseman. Whoever it was, Ichabod Crane was never again seen in Sleepy Hollow. But will the headless horseman be seen on a rainy late afternoon in Tuckahoe? Quite possibly. Now, the Headless Horseman is real. The story is called a legend, meaning it holds truth. And back in the early days of the American Revolution, say the summer of 1777, maybe instead of gathering at a library, you might have gathered in a little tavern or maybe in someone's parlor. And with a crackling fire in front of you, you may, you may have said to your friend or neighbor, we'd best put that fire out. What? Put out a home fire? Ah, why, that would be most horrible to do. Why, we need the fire. We never put out the home fire. Well, we may need to do it. Pray thee tell why. And then, perhaps your friend, your neighbor, the passerby coming up from Manhattan would have said, you don't know about them Hessians. Who? Hushmen? I think they're called Hessians. Are they from France? Like those in New Rochelle? Nah, nah. They're from 
Well, from Rochelle. But the Hessians, they're from Germany. Oh, what are they like? There's nothing likable about any of them Hessians. Why is that? You know what they did? You know what they did at the Battle of Brooklyn? Why? Some of our young men, just farm boys, blacksmiths, merchants, how to help our cause for liberty and independence. After all, we got forced into it. The king doesn't care for us. Why, putting taxes upon us, not giving any voice. You know what, um, what's his name, Thomas Paine says, no taxation without representation. Oh, try telling that to the king. But you know what the king is telling us? He sent it in these Hessians. Well, what are they like? Like I said, there's nothing to like about them. Why? They're strange looking, them Hessian soldiers. They're tall, they wear great hats made of bear skin. But on the front, they have a metal plate with a skull and crossed bones. Like pirates, worse than pirates, they grant no mercy. And these pirates might try to get you to join up with them, not these Hessians. What do they do? I'll tell you what they did. This is what we heard in the taverns on Manhattan Island. At the battle, they surrounded that old little Brooklyn courthouse. And there were some Marylanders and Delaware men. They, they tried to surrender. They threw up their arms. They threw down their weapons. And what did the Hessians do? Have all! They stabbed our young men with a bayonet. What's a bayonet? Oh, it's terrible. It's no knife. It's like a three-sided pointed blade. And when it goes in, blood comes out until you bleed to death. You mean the, the men, our men, fighting for liberty, were trying to surrender? Yep, and the Hessians stabbed them. That's Hessian quarter. Mercy. No mercy at all. Oh, that's why I'm saying you better put out the home fires. There's something else. It's even worse. I don't know if I want to tell you. Well, by now, if you had said that, if you were listening to this fellow in a tavern not far from here, you would have crowded around and say, tell us. Tell us the worst part about them Hessians. Well, it's this. They landed just a little north at New Rochelle, near Davenport Neck, and they went round foraging, wanting to take Oh, chickens or pigs or cows or cabbage, anything they can get their hands on. Now, some of us knew to hide the cows and pigs off in the woods. So if the Hessians arrived and they found there were no pigs or cows, you know what the, some of them did? They would take children and roast them up and eat them. No, God forbid. Are you telling the truth? I'm just telling what I heard. And something strange about these Hessians, the way they look. Oh, yea, they wear these bearskin hats, but some of them look as though they have four sets of teeth, two mouths, the quicker to devour the children. When these stories began to spread in the early days of the American Revolution, oh, you could not blame people for living round here, for putting out their home fires, hoping, praying, no Hessian would show up. Of course, the Hessians had a different perspective. Oh, now I know some of you might be thinking, oh, they were mercenaries. Well, not exactly. A mercenary is someone who offers their services in exchange for a certain amount of money. Hessian soldiers were soldiers under the command of the Prince of Hessia Casal, a cousin distant to King George III. He was from Hanover, Hanover being a province in Germany. And he said he would pay the prince. And all the prince had to do was just order his generals to send the Hessians to wherever he so desired. And where did he desire the soldiers to go? Here, to join up with the huge expeditionary force of over 45,000 fighters sent 
on 100 warships across the ocean, landing on Staten Island during the summer of 1776. And they marched out of Staten Island, then they went out to Brooklyn, there to engage with, as they called him, Mr. Washington, even though the Continental Army had designated him a lieutenant general. No, they thought him of him as a rebel, rebelling against the king. And now that very fact to the Hessians was abhorrent, detestable. How can you possibly would have thought a Hessian soldier, say, like um, Christian Ranga, how could you think that you could be ruled in any way other than by divine right, the hand of God anointing a particular person of noble blood to rule? Oh yes, there are times when nobility does not rule properly, but they would be far better than having, like me, a common soldier or a common farmer, a blacksmith, even a merchant to rule. What do they know about governing without a drop of nobility in their veins? Nothing. Now, what have we learned, Christian Ranga would have said, about these, these rebels? They say they want something called democracy, some strange concept from the ancient Greece, Greeks. But you know what it really is? Why, I'll tell you. It's something I heard from a preacher from Rye named the Reverend Seabury, who claimed democracy is nothing more than mob rule. What will it mean? That we here in the colonies will have no friends, no allies, and we will be then overrun whether it would be by the Dutch or the Portuguese or the Spanish or the French or the native folk, will be overrun and ruined. We'll have no protection from our sovereign king. And it's worse than that, said Reverend Seabury, and, Rev and, and Christian Ranga would have agreed. We'll have no place to sell our wheat, our wood, our beaver skins. We will go bankrupt. And then do you know what will happen? The leaders of those in the mob will come forth and say, oh, you have no business? Well, then we'll just buy your farm for far less than what it's worth. And then they will become the tyrants worse than any tyrannical king. That's what will happen. This is what the likes of Alexander MacDougall and Isaac Sears and why Alexander Hamilton want. So, why are we here? Yes, we're fighting for our prince, Christian Ranga would have said. But we are also fighting to stop this scourge of mob rule, where, where people rise up willy-nilly, commoners without educations, wanting to take over and rule, and ruin your life and any liberty you may now enjoy. That's why we fight. That's why we will plunge our bayonets into those who take up arms against a sovereign, godly, anointed king. And so, there were the two sides set forth. But now, it came time for fighting. And George Washington had a continental army, though few of them had uniforms. Mostly they were just volunteers coming in from the wilds of Pennsylvania wearing white linen. They came from Maryland and Delaware wearing their long frocks. Some of them from North Carolina had, had, had weapons, rifles to shoot birds at a great distance. Maybe they could put them to shoot some of the officers considered a cowardly thing, but it had to be done. They had come from New England and New York and New Jersey, too. And now Washington, after fleeing with his army, thanks to Colonel John Glover and his marblehead boatmen, he managed to get them across the rough currents of the East River. And then they went fleeing up along the broad way through Manhattan. Washington found, why, he would have to fight to even make his men fight. Consider this. 
about midway up Manhattan, when Washington and his men were fleeing to get to Harlem Heights to regroup, many of his men saw the Hessians coming with their great bare skin hats and the metal plates with skulls and crossbones. And when they saw them marching along, wondering, do they really have two mouths? Why, they didn't even follow orders, which was to get down on bended knee and give two shots before you flee. They threw their guns. Washington, disgusted, went after the young farm boys and drew out his sword and turned the back end of it and slapped the men. Turn round, turn round, hold your ground. Fight for your liberty, fight for your, your independence and freedom. Ah! But the men were in a panic. Washington was in a rage. And some of his own guard had to ride out and take his horse's rein and lead him away to prevent him from being captured on the middle of Manhattan, not far from what's now called uh, Times Square. Such was Washington's rage. These were his soldiers. But by his example, he was trying to steal them. Now, after a time at Harlem Heights, and a battle there took place, Washington ordered his men to flee into Westchester County. It then included the lands formerly owned by Jonas Bronx, called by the Dutch the Friedeland, where, why, you could come and settle, and you didn't even have to be part of any particular religious group, as oft you'd have to do up in New England. And then the Hessians came marching through. The stories already filled people's ears and hearts with fear. And so those who once were throwing away their weapons now took them up. And they did something which may have seemed a bit cowardly, but they felt it was the only way they could fight off this well-seasoned fighting force. They hid behind stone walls near Pelham's Manor, and when the soldiers became marching up, they fired upon the Hessians and brought down and wounded hundreds of them. But Washington felt he needed to do all he could to just keep his fighting force and his supplies together. So they fled north and gathered round a kind of desolate place, lorded over by several hills. The place had been known by the native folk around here, the Wequis Quake and the Sint Sink and the Siwanoi as Quaropus. Maybe you've gone to court there, Quaropus Avenue and White Plains. Well, it meant and means the place of the white misty swamp, and no doubt it had a swampy stench about it. Well, there they tried to hold ground, but General Howe and his assistant commander, General Sir Henry Clinton, and the commander of the German forces, a General Neifenhausen, and a General Ralph, they surveyed where Washington had put his forces and discovered there was a, a weak spot. So they crossed over the Bronx River and a little bit north of White Plains and a little bit south in Scarsdale, they set cannon and began to fire. And at length, Washington finally discovered something whispered into his ear from generals Israel Putnam and William Heath. You must go up onto Chatterton's Hill. It's the only place where we can make a stand. And he listened. And the militiamen, the Continentals from Maryland and Pennsylvania, Delaware, New England, New York, and New Jersey, they're all gathered. They looked down into the fields, the white marshy places, and saw not only the Hessians with their great bearskin hats, but British dragoons on horseback who were fierce, who would come forward with pistols and swords, and behind them to clean up any of the wounded with a thrust were 
well-seasoned soldiers in the British Army. Well, Putnam and Heath and Washington and the other generals gave orders to the men, just give us two shots and hold your ground. But they did more than that. Those untrained forces, those farmers, blacksmiths and apothecaries, they held out for quite a while. But in that while, the wily General Howe sent his men round to flank the American forces. And up they came with cannon, bayonet, and horses. The Americans held for as long as they could, and Washington, not wanting to see his forces decimated, call off the attack, retreat and regroup. And when day was dissolving into night, Washington, with close to 12,000 men, retreated, though now they had lost close to 200, wounded, captured, or killed. But the Redcoats and the Hessians and their green coats, they suffered similar losses. But because they pushed the Americans off of Chatterton's Hill and away from White Plains, the British were considered victorious. And so they encamped. And General Howe no doubt brought out his claret and began to drink and thought, well now no doubt Washington and his forces will see that we are quite the army to be reckoned with. I expect him to be issuing his surrender soon and we'll negotiate um, well, some kind of a treaty to we'll end this foolish revolution, this um, call for mob rule. Well, Henry Clinton and the Germans, they were not convinced. And they said, we must go in now and wipe them out. And Clinton said, yes, I think we ought to give them a taste of their own medicine. How so, wondered General Howe. Well, I believe that um, we should attack at night. At night? Why, it's too dark. Oh, it's dark, but they have their little fires, and they'll all be sitting round, no doubt, getting inebriated on their hard cider. But we can attack and use the element of surprise against us, just as they used it against us when they attacked our Hessian allies in Pelham. Yavo, yavo, agreed the Hessians. So they decided they were going to a mountain attack. And now this was right around this time of year, actually closer to All Hallows' Eve. But then, just as they were about to go out into the night, another godsend. Why, it's what's happening here. The skies opened and rain came. And in these days of which I'm speaking, 1776, you cannot fire your flintlock unless you keep your powder dry. And someone did. And so the British attack with the Hessians against the rebelling Americans got called off. And now, morning came, a little bit atmospheric as it was this morning. But General Heath wanted to do some reconnaissance. He wanted to determine where the Americans had a certain strength, cannon, cannon. Oh, they didn't have many. But during that summer, a certain college student from King's College came down from his vantage point, his high heights, to the tip of Manhattan Island. And there at Francis Tavern with some of his compatriots, he met up with a tailor from Ireland with the best name ever for a revolutionary, Hercules Mulligan. Oh, don't you wish your name was Hercules Mulligan? I was thinking of changing my name to that. Now that was his given name and, well, out they went. This thin college student with reddish hair who'd grown up on a tropical island, who'd been orphaned, but now had won the favor of certain distinguished gentlemen and was getting educated at King's College. 
but his education learned him or, or brought him to stir up his soul and told him that he wanted liberty and independence. Why, he was the one who stood up against the calls put out by the Reverend Seabury. Remember that preacher from Rye who said, Oh, um, you must turn against anyone calling for democracy as if you were turning against a scorpion. It is nothing but mob rule. And indeed, with Christian Ranga nodding his head in agreement, this fellow would have been shaking his head vigorously, for this fellow was Alexander Hamilton. He said, we are perfectly capable of ruling ourselves. Why, we already have legislatures, and they're perfectly capable of providing taxes and leadership. We don't need a distant king who ignores our requests, quarters troops in our homes, and ignores our calls for just the most basic rights, natural rights. We can trade with other nations and defend ourselves. And to make sure there would be a defense Alexander Hamilton and Hercules Mulligan went down to the tip of Manhattan and there, right under the noses of British warships, they hauled away cannon. But the British got angry and they sent out warships like the Asia and the Phoenix and the Rose and they began to fire into the air and cannon balls were raining down. Why, one of them even caught fire on uh, Franz's tavern. But Hamilton succeeded in hauling away those cannons and now, Heath wanted to be sure that those cannons remained in American hands. Well, he made sure that those under his command watching over the cannons followed his edict, keep the powder dry. I don't care if you have to sleep with it. Keep it dry. Now, the Hessians they wanted to catch the Americans unaware. And they firmly believed these Americans. They know nothing about warfare. <laughs> you think they're keeping their powder dry? They're just drinking their hard cider at night, singing their songs like Yankee Doodle went to town. Ha! We'll go to town on them, and with their girls we'll be handy. Get it? Well... But it but it up, but it up, but it up. Early in the morning, just round Halloween, near a place now called Silver Lake in White Plains, then called Horton's Mill, there comes a riding, but it up, 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 a Hessian artilleryman. Behind him, several others on horseback, and some on foot. What is their mission? To discover where the Americans were hiding their cannon and to take them. Well, they came upon one under the command of a Lieutenant Fanno. And he had managed to follow the orders given to him through Heath, through, quite likely, Alexander Hamilton. And when the Hessian came round, those under the command of Lieutenant Fanno, five or six, had been, well, a little bit bored during the night with the rain, they put up some blankets and little tarps, and they had a fire going, and they had 12-pound shots, and they had the powder dry. So they took the 12-pound shots, would fit in the palm of your hand, and put them into the fireplace until they began to glow a bit red. Thus, ba -da -dump, ba -da -dump, ba -da -dump, ba -da dump when this artillery man comes by, ah, oh, let's give them a little warm treat. How about we hurl a pumpkin at them? They put in the powder, jammed it in, and with tongs picked up that red hot cannonball and put it in, and then when they were within range, boom! The cannon got fired. Because it was hot, it may have broken into pieces. And years later, General William Heath, in 1799, wrote in his journal, one of our 12-pound shot took off the head of a Hessian artilleryman and brought down his horse. Any other casualties they suffered were unknown.
But what a casualty. No doubt those who were there, eyewitnessing this, would have been shocked. Would have told the tale many a time over. After all, these were farm boys who maybe had traveled at the most in their lifetime, 50 miles. Mostly they would come from around here and go down to New York City, and that would have been why a wonder to visit a town of 20,000 people. Ah, and you would have seen for a few moments, long indelible moments, the figure of a soldier with a green coat turning scarlet with blood spewing out, galloping toward you before the horse would fall. No doubt, once you got to a tavern, once you got an opportunity to write a letter home, you would have described this scene. And the story soon spread of a Hessian losing his head. But ah, now things get more and more curious. Where did the headless horseman indeed come from? Well, know this. Stories abounded that the prince would only have to get, get paid if his Hessians were killed. That wasn't necessarily true. But many a time the Hessians had a tradition of sometimes just leaving their dead behind, feeling that, well, nature and God would take care of the body. And the American colonists, they didn't want to touch those bodies. Why, Joseph Plum Martin, the most renowned diarist of the day, uh, wrote after being at the Battle of White Plains, returning months and months later, and finding in the field forlorn bodies of Hessians left behind to decompose. Well, months after that Hessian lost his head, the Van Tassel family happened upon the body. There were many, many Van Tassels. Over in Elmsford, some of the Van Tassel cousins, the Reynolds, had been pointed out by neighbors, they're rebels, they're rebelling against the king. You can burn down their houses. Can you give me some silver for ratting them out? Indeed. The Hessians showed up and said, By the powers granted to us by the king, we must burn down your house, for you are rebels. You have 15 minutes to remove all your items from the house. And so you'd have to remove everything as quickly as possible. Well, when this was going on, Cornelius, a boy about 12, climbed onto the roof and he had a gun, and he fired it at the Hessians, but he missed. Then he began to swing the gun and hit some of the Hessians in the face. And the Hessians got angry. Some of them laughed that a boy was striking them. But in the midst of all of this, screams went up from Cornelius' cousin. My baby, Leah, my baby, Leah, she's still in the house. The house now is engulfed in flames. But one of those Hessians hit by Cornelius's rifle butt, ran in through the flames, his green coat beginning to smoke. He found the little two-year-old Leah and brought her out to a relieved and tearfully joyous mother. And even though the Hessians forced them with the burning of their house to have to live in the root cellar, the family was grateful. Thus, when they found that decapitated Hessian's body on the battlefield, they gathered it up and brought it to the old Dutch church in Sleepy Hollow. And there they begged the Domini, may we bury this body here? Well, he was a fearful sort, did not like strangers, spoke Dutch, but he agreed, saying, however, this Hessian may not be a Christian. It has no head. It gets no headstone. And some claim that insult and the spells of Sleepy Hollow and some inexorable desire for that Hessian to bind his head caused the spirit to rise up 
and scour these roads, yes, these roads here in Tuckahoe too, for that missing head. And what caused the spells? Well, ancient historians say in the days of the native folk, the Wequisquake feared the Mohawk, who often would come down, warrior, and demand tribute, meaning tobacco, wheat, uh, wampum, from the less offensive, if you will, Lene Lenape, the Mahican, the Algonquin speakers who lived along the river that flowed both ways, the Mahikanituk, now known as the Hudson. Well, one time the Mohawk got sick. Some say a spell was cast upon them or a curse. Others say it was, well, maybe they ate too many um, oysters and they got sick and died. And the Wequisquake just left the bodies where they fell. But eventually, dirt and leaves covered them up. But then, strange people came to live among the Wequisquake the Algonquin-speaking Lene Lenape. They looked at once as though they may have been sick. Maybe they were spirits. Maybe they were animals. After all, the men had like an animal hair on their faces. So there they were. And they were peculiar. They were disrespectful. When they were told, don't dig that up, that's our pumpkin patch, they did. The Dutch plowed right over it, releasing the spirits of those Mohawk warriors and cursing the place, causing that Hessian to rise up to seek his missing head. Maybe his spirit did not want to cross into the next life headless, incomplete. Or maybe it's just some malevolent figure who wants to maraud and haunt. But reports reached the ears of a young Washington Irving. See, when he was a teenager, he traveled around here. Well, he was supposedly hunting with his friend, James Kirkpalding, but they were hunting for stories. And they went to a place called Carl's Mill, it was owned by the wealthiest family in all of not just Westchester, not just New York, but all of the colonies, the Phillipses. And they were on the side of the king when the revolution broke out. But, um, well, there was an old farm, a mill set up by them, and it was run by a formerly enslaved fellow, possibly by the name of Carl. It's on the border of now where Briarcliff and... Uh, and Sleepy Hollow meet on old Sleepy Hollow Road. I saw the old mill wheel myself and imagined Washington Irving sitting there with this fellow, pulling on his chin whiskers and wondering, how much should I tell these two lads about, oh, the headless horseman. And he told of how this fellow lost his head at the Battle of White Plains. That's one secret Washington Irving hasn't revealed, but what other battle could there have been? A big cannon firing. That's really the only one. And there is the smoking cannon, the journal of General William Heath, where he wrote that he saw this Hessian lose his head. But now for the spirited part. The old fellow, the miller, perhaps named Carl, pulled on his beard and said, you know what the spells of Sleepy Hollow do, young men? Calls up these spirits, causes the headless horseman to ride out and scour these roads for that missing head. It's unrelenting in wanting that head. Gallivants round at night. You watch for it. You better hold on to your head too. Many have reported hearing it out there like a blast of wind on wings scouring for that head. It always returns before the dawn to its unmarked grave. 
nearby the old Dutch church. No doubt that struck the heart, mind, body, and soul of young Washington Irving. But he began to hear more about this headless spirit. Why? Years went by, and when he was serving in the War of 1812, a certain family friend, a um, fellow involved in a famous duel, a former vice president, um, I know you're thinking Dick Cheney. This was a fellow who had gotten even more trouble than, than Dick Cheney did with his gun. This fellow was Aaron Burr. He was a friend of the Irvings. And he told them about a, another fellow, an American, who had lost his head at a battle. And there were reports of that happening in New Jersey. That's why they claimed the headless horseman from time to time. But Washington Irving listened. And then, in 1819, he visited Sir Walter Scott's Abbotsford up in Scotland. And there, he got to peruse Scott's extensive library. And Scott had translated a story from a German kind of lengthy fairy tale called a Marchen. You thought I said Martian, right? It's Marchen, auf Deutsch. And it concerned a wild hunter who hunted with such intensity, with such passion, that he didn't even realize he was dead. And he continued to hunt after his spirit had left the body. And once a brash nobleman asked the wild hunter, what have you hunted? The gates. And zhoo, the wild ghostly hunter hurled a piece of rotten flesh at the noble and knocked him down. And Washington Irving remembered reading that and borrowed the word hurl and put it into the legend of Sleepy Hollow. He also learned about some another strange character named Nip Number Five, who wandered out from a kind of chaotic place known as Gotham. And he was a tiny fellow, but he wore a huge hat, making him appear as though he had no head. And when he came upon a carriage with a wealthy lady, the carriageman said, oh, oh, I have to go back. There's a fellow without a head. And she said, oh, there's many men running around without their heads. Carry on, carry on. And Washington Irving, he borrowed that as well. He also borrowed a little bit from a Scotsman's poem, Robert Burns. You know Robert Burns. He wrote, should old acquaintance be forgot and ever brought to mind? I'll take a cup of kindness yet for her days of Robert Burns. He wrote a poem called Tam o Shanter about a certain bewitching spirit who chases a fellow to a bridge. And the fellow goes across the bridge, but not the spirit. It tears off the horse's tail. And the fellow gets away. So all of that and a certain tradition where when you've come to a little Dutch community and you're not quite, well, fitting in with the varied customs, the Dutch had a custom to test you. They would try to drive you away by dressing up like a ghost. And Washington Irving heard this report from Jesse Merwin while visiting in Columbia County, an estate owned by a fellow by the name of Van Ness, who served, uh, by the way, as um, Aaron Burr's second at that famed, that infamous duel, I should say. It later became Martin Van Buren's place, Kinderhook. But there, Washington Irving heard about a schoolmaster from Connecticut who almost got chased away from that Dutch community of Kinderhook. But instead, he resolved himself and went and proposed marriage to Jane Van Dyke. Unlike Ichabod Crane, who was less successful with his proposal to Katrina Van Tassel. So all this brings us back 
to that headless horseman. Yes, written about in the journal of William Keith, told in tales to Washington Irving by Carl, or at least that formerly enslaved fellow at Carl's Mill. The story echoed in German and Scottish lore, and even found in the old practices of the Dutch settlers in these parts, who gave us such prosaic or poetic place names like Yonkers, or Fishkill, Peekskill, Catskill. Oh, you think nothing of it, but you go to California like I have and said, oh yeah, I live near Fishkill. They're like, what? Dude, what are you talking about? They kill fish there? Harley, man. I, yeah. and, and I said, well, you know, I grew up in the area, Yonkers. Whoa, what's a Yonker? Like a snack food? Kale or something? No, no, the legacy of the Dutch. Well, that's one of the Dutch traditions to chase off interlopers. But unfortunately, or maybe fortunately for us, that goblin still rides on these roads, especially with the atmospheric rain we're having tonight. And it still seeks what it wants most, that missing head. And last, before I see if you have any questions, I'm going to reveal the name, although you've heard it, of the Headless Horseman. Indeed, I wrote a book, you can get it through me a little later, but a friend of mine, a colleague, uh, Christopher Redino, did exhaustive research and determined by going to Germany and looking over lists of soldiers that the name of the Hessian who lost his head just after the Battle of White Plains was indeed Christian Ranga, spelled R-A-N-G-E, like range. And so, my friends, there you have it, the stuff of legend proven to hold truth, the story behind the Headless Horseman of White Plains and nearby Tuckahoe and Sleepy Hollow. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'd be honored to take any questions or comments or critiques here and now. So, yes, please. What part of modern day Germany is Hesse? Is, was Hesse located? Um, I'm not too sure of the geography, but it is con today a. Um, one of the provinces, I think there's 26 of them, and it's a little, it's between southern Bavaria and northern, um, like uh, near Hanover, but it is, it continues to be a province uh, today, and at the time, it was Germany, like Italy, was kind of fragmented in all these little principalities and all of that, so that's where it's from. Any other comments, questions? Yes, please. They were, essentially. And in the end, though, curiously enough, um, I think there were as many as 30 or 35,000, and estimated 14,000, almost, you know, like 40%, remained here after fighting against the people with whom they were going to stay. So they were, um, became, you know, convinced that, um, yes, there can be this mob rule democracy. It does kind of work. So... But I felt, him, you know, as you could tell from the way I told the tale, it important to know what stories were in the air and that there literally is primary source evidence of Hessians being described as having two mouths. And I think it was because they wore pointed mustaches. And unlike you, who look very distinct with, with your mustache, people were unfamiliar with that. And so if you had the mustache, and the chin strap, oh, the guy over there, look, he's got two mouths, yeah, he's going to eat the kids, you know. So that was a big deal back then. Any other comments or questions here about the headless horseman and all? And um, I'd be honored if you were to, you know, come to see my show at Sunnyside, where I tell the entire 
tale, kind of a, a more of like an abridged version of the legend of Sleepy Hollow. Weekends for the rest of this month, Friday, Saturday, Sunday at 6, 8, and 9.30. You need to get tickets ahead of time through um, historic Hudson Valley, or you can, um, you know, on the bookmark, send me an email and let me know. And uh, if you have any trouble, I'll, I'll help you out. And um, the Headless Horseman does make a kind of appearance there, and there are some ghostly puppeteers, so it's not just me there at uh, Sunnyside. And I'm really grateful to um, not only the Westchester 250 Association and the library, but um, Elaine over here for arranging, you know, and it takes a lot of doing to make this possible. So thanks very much for having me. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm sure you're going to definitely want to seek out his performances, and um, we just we look forward to having you back again. Oh, I, I would so, be honored, yes. Thank you so much, and thank you for coming out yeah. tonight. It was very, it was very atmospheric. Indeed. Us, so I think yeah. <laughs> uh, we appreciate you coming out in the rain, but it kind of set the mood, and yeah. it was just perfect. Thank oh, you so you're, much, you're so welcome. Thank we you, too. It. Yeah, and I think the horseman may be on the Bronx River Parkway, but if you take exit four, you, you might be able to miss him, though. <laughs> so, <laughs> you've seen him out there? Yeah, he causes those traffic jams there. Very good. So All right, thanks again for having me and for coming out. Thank you.